Fantastic. Well, well, thank you guys all so much for having me. Uh, I, we're all getting adjusted to this this crazy new world that we're living in, and I'm I'm really uh, I'm glad that um, I can I can help you guys pass the time some way in a, in a socially distancing uh, appropriate appropriate fashion. Uh, and of course, it's it's very fitting that I'm I'm speaking to you uh, about beavers in in Oregon, given uh, your your state animal and your state flag. Uh, I have myself live in Spokane, Washington, uh, not quite as beavery as as uh, Western Oregon, but uh, pretty. We've, we've got some some good populations in the Spokane River, nonetheless. So uh, I wanted to begin my talk tonight. So so tonight I'll be I'll be talking a lot about beavers as restoration tools. You know these incredible dam building, water storing rodents that we can manipulate in various ways to uh, to provide ecosystem services that we that we care about. But I, I thought I'd, I'd begin by talking about the beaver as organism, as, as evolutionary marvel, because of course they're, they're really incredible creatures. Uh, beavers are rodents, obviously. They're North America's largest rodent, the second largest rodent in the world behind the, the capybara. Uh, Full-grown beaver is, you know, 50 to 60 pounds in, in some cases. So they're, they're pretty uh, hefty animals, I think, bigger than most people probably expect. And of course, they're semi-aquatic rodents. So they spend all of their lives <clears throat> in, in and around water. And they've got all kinds of, of really wonderful adaptations for this unique semi-aquatic lifestyle they, they lead. Uh, first, they've got extraordinarily dense fur, some of the densest fur in the animal kingdom. Beavers actually have as many individual hairs on a, a postage stamp size patch of skin as we have on our entire heads. So remarkably dense fur. Uh, they've got these wonderful webbed duck-like hind feet. They're very powerful, agile swimmers, of course, they can stay underwater for up to, up to 15 minutes, uh, which I think is pretty impressive. Uh, they've actually got a, a second set of eyelids, uh, a set of transparent eyelids called nictitating membranes uh, that function as goggles, as well as a second set of lips, uh, a set of fur-lined lips behind their front teeth that they can close like a valve to chew and drag branches underwater uh, without drowning. I think that's a, a really amazing feature. Uh, and then, of course, what's the beaver's most iconic feature? What makes a beaver recognizably a beaver, the tail, right? Uh, the tail is kind of this wonderful multi-purpose uh, appendage. It's a, a fat storage device. So beavers actually put on fat for the winter in their tails, uh, which is which is pretty rad. Uh, it's also a, a rudder while they swim. And it's a, an alarm system, of course, I'm sure. You know, anybody who's spent time in and around beaver ponds and wetlands has heard beavers smack their tail on the water to warn other beavers uh, about the presence of predators. So the tail is the tail is doing you know kind of quadruple duty uh, in some respects. Uh, and then the other wonderful iconic beaver feature, of course, is their teeth. Uh, you can sort of see in this picture that the top and bottom incisors uh, basically move together and and file each other down into these kind of chisel-like points that are, are very good for tree cutting. Uh, and beaver's teeth are actually orange, as you can see, because they're they're structurally fortified with iron that beavers derive from their food. So the teeth are, are really remarkable. Uh, and it's important, of course, to have those durable, powerful teeth when you spend your whole life uh, cutting down trees, right? Beavers are, uh, are what scientists call choosy generalists. Uh, they've got a, a few species of tree that they prefer, you know, aspen, willow, cottonwood, those are kind of the classics, but they'll eat just about any deciduous tree. Uh, and of course, what they're eating is that, that inner bark, the cambium, that's kind of the nice sugary, uh, nutritious layer. Uh, and they're also eating lots of kind of green herbaceous plants as well, you know, water lilies, cattails, uh, they, they graze pretty happily. I've seen them basically mow people's lawns for them. Uh, beavers, of course, are entirely herbivorous. Uh, they do not eat any fish whatsoever. Uh, you know, if people who grew up reading Chronicles of Narnia may, may recall Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, uh, who are pescatarians in, in Narnia, but uh, C.S. Lewis had beaver biology wrong. Beavers, of course, are totally herbivorous, but you guys are Oregonians, so you, you know that already. So of course, in addition to eating the cambium from the trees they cut down, beavers also use that wood as construction material. Uh, and there are, there are two basic types of beaver structures. Uh, there's the lodge, that's the kind of the fundamental beaver housing unit. Uh, you can sort of see in this picture, there are some underwater tunnels 
that lead up and into the lodge. And inside the lodge, there's kind of a, an elevated, an elevated nesting chamber. Uh, and a typical beaver colony or family that's all cohabitating together in that lodge is two to as many as eight beavers or so. Uh, and that's that's the mating pair, the male and female, uh, the newborn kits who are born in the spring, the baby beavers, the one-year-olds and the two-year-olds. So you've got three year classes of offspring all cohabitating in a lodge. And during their second year, those two-year-olds, those, those teenage beaver, beavers will disperse out uh, looking for their own territory to inhabit. And beavers are, are very territorial animals, so it can be hard for a, a two-year-old beaver to find a, a vacant niche. Here's a, a, nice, a nice view of a lodge in, in Minnesota. And, and in this case, you know, the beavers have abandoned this pond. Uh, the water level has dropped. And you can really see all of those, all of those entrances and exits, all, all of those escape tunnels. And uh, you can see what a, a complex piece of architecture uh, a beaver lodge really is. So that's the lodge. And then, of course, the, the second uh, classic beaver structure, you know, the thing that beavers are famous for is the dam. Right, so so beavers, you know, so dams are built out of out of wood. Uh, you can see that there's usually kind of kind of a rocky foundation in many cases. Uh, the whole thing is sealed with mud and and dead leaves. Uh, and you know, the 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 dam is a, a really, of course, it's a really hyper specialized, basically unique behavior uh, in in the animal kingdom. Uh, and the reason for the dam is primarily shelter. Right, beavers uh, in water, you know, they're they're these wonderful. Um, powerful swimmers, but on land, uh, as one biologist put it to me, beavers are basically fat, slow, smelly packages of meat uh, who, that get devoured by wolves, cougars, black bears, grizzly bears, coyotes. So by deepening and expanding that pool of water, beavers are basically enhancing their own habitat, right? Instead of having to you know, swim over to that, that, or instead of having to walk over land, to a good looking aspen tree and you know maybe get eaten by a wolf along the way, they can swim to it instead and be comparatively safe. So the dam is really primarily um, a form of, of just creating that watery shelter uh, in which beavers are safe and comfortable. And here's a, a beaver that, uh, this is what happens when you're a, a beaver that wanders onto land. This is a, a beaver in Minnesota that was devoured by a wolf and wolves actually eat the entirety of the beaver, uh, bones and all, uh, except for that, that mandible and, uh, and the incisors. So don't want to be a beaver on land. So of course, beaver dams come in this uh, an amazing variety of shapes and sizes, right? A typical beaver colony or family uh, is building, you know, several to, in some cases, as many as 20 dams. Uh, and that's usually a big primary dam. Uh, and then that's kind of creating a central impoundment and then, you know, a number of smaller secondary dams. You know, here's kind of a, a typical secondary dam in Montana that's probably, you know, three feet long and uh, a foot high. Uh, and here's a, a really nice primary dam, uh, again, in northern Minnesota, that's probably about 14 or 15 feet tall uh, and, you know, maybe three or 400 feet long. And it's the work of, of many, many generations of beavers all, all contributing their, their stick uh, to this, this pretty remarkable feat of, of engineering. So of course these these you know massive dams like that one, um, or even a you know a smaller but very well placed dam, uh, can create some some pretty spectacular impoundments. Right here's a, a beaver dam, uh, again in the upper Midwest. Uh, that's probably 250 acres or so, or beaver pond rather. That's 250 acres. So the impoundments that these dams create uh, are really trapping enormous amounts of water in many cases and modifying landscapes at, uh, at really enormous scales. You know, and, and we wouldn't see anything like this in, in Eastern Washington where I live necessarily. You know, our streams are a little too flashy. They're steep, they're tight. Um, you know, so, this, so, so beaver dams, uh, you know, tend to get blown out um, quicker in the, in the West than in the, the upper Midwest or the, the Northeast. But this is the sort of thing that beavers are capable of uh, in the, the right circumstances. And the other really important beaver feature that I, I think we don't talk enough about uh, is, is their, their canal networks. You know, beavers are wonderful builders, but they're also incredible diggers. Uh, and they excavate these really wonderful labyrinths of, of canals that uh, in some cases extend you know, several hundred feet uh, up into the forest. And there again, the point is, you know, you can swim up that canal, cut down a tree and float it back down the canal 
all without ever leaving the water. Uh, so again, these canal networks are you know, a great way of, of reaching food uh, without having to expose yourself to predation. So when you put it all together, all of those, all of those dams and canal networks, you know, the results can be pretty spectacular. Uh, here's a, a, a really nice beaver complex in Colorado. Uh, this is probably 12,000 feet or so up, up by the Continental Divide, so they can really get up there. Uh, and you know, here you can see that you know, were it not for beavers, you know, this stream would just be a, a straight string running right through this valley. But instead, of course, beavers have built all of these dams. Those are, you know, those are those, those horizontal structures and are just storing enormous amounts of water uh, in this, this beautiful little valley. So beavers are, of course, they're you know, just incredible um, landscape modifiers and, and water storers. So of course, beavers are, are building dams and creating these ponds as a way of, of enhancing their own habitat. But in the process, they're also creating habitat for lots of other creatures as well, right? In the American West, wetlands cover about 2% of land area. Uh, but support around 80% of total biodiversity. So any creature that's capable of building and maintaining and expanding those wetlands starts to look really, really important. Uh, and you know, so, so beavers are what scientists call a, a keystone species, right? And in architecture, the keystone is the top block in a stone arch. And if you, if you remove that block, the whole arch crumbles. And beavers are playing similar roles in ecosystems, right? Disproportionately supporting uh, a whole a whole lot of weight. So you know, basically, I mean, name name an animal, uh, you know, in the American West or really any, anywhere in North America, and it, it benefits from beavers in some ways. Of course, you know, we know that um, most species of amphibians uh, do really well breeding and living in and around beaver ponds. This is a boreal toad, uh, which in some places is basically an obligate beaver pond breeder. You know, 90% or so of boreal toad breeding habitat uh, in some places is beaver ponds. Uh, you know, we, we know that that waterfowl and wading birds uh, are really dependent upon beaver complexes. This is a, a great blue heron rookery uh, at a, a beaver pond in, in Wisconsin. Uh, of course, we know that moose, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, in many cases, biologists basically use the presence of beaver as a proxy for available moose habitat. Uh, you know, moose are eating aquatic vegetation and browsing on the willow that beavers are essentially irrigating for them. Um, so, the, you know, the list of beaver connections is basically endless. Here's a, a really cool site. Um, again, this is in Voyagers National Park in, in Minnesota. Uh, and here, what, what had happened was that, the, you know, the beavers uh, abandoned the area, uh, the dam broke down, the pond drained, exposing the lodge, uh, and a wolf pack actually moved into the lodge and raised its pups uh, inside of that lodge. That's, that's beavers creating habitat for a direct predator. I think that's, that's pretty incredible. So another really vital beaver connection is between beavers and salmonids, right? This is a juvenile steelhead. Uh, you know, this is a, a, uh, this is a, a fish from the, um, from the, the John Day Basin in, in Oregon, uh, part of the, the Columbia River watershed, of course. And, uh, you know, we, we know that, that one of the things that, that really cost fish habitat is, is, is the, was the production of beavers. You know, if you're a juvenile steelhead or, you know, a coho salmon or any salmonid, uh, you know, you don't, you don't want to live in the main stem of a, of a stream, right? You're just going to get blown down river by that fire hose. You know, you want some kind of nice slow water refuge, a backwater or a pool or a side channel or an eddy. You know, you want that complex habitat which is exactly what beavers create. So beavers are really one of the most important tools we have uh, for, for salmon recovery. And in fact, researchers have found that, that, you know, that um, in, in Oregon, stream complexes with lots of beaver infrastructure, um, juvenile steelhead survival is about 50% higher uh, than streams without all of that beaver, all of that beaver created infrastructure. So, so beaver, the kind of the beaver, steelhead and salmonid connection uh, is, is really powerful. One common objection that you hear from, from fish biologists and, uh, and some anglers, um, of which I am one myself, uh, of course, is that you know, we're trying to take dams out of streams right now, right? We're trying to eliminate uh, you know, or, or increase spill uh, over, over dams rather than creating new ones. But of course, beaver dams are, are nothing like giant human-built concrete dams, right? You know, Beaver Dam is nothing like the Bonneville Dam 
Uh, fish have no problem jumping over beaver dams, swimming around them during times of high flow, even wriggling through uh, the, the wood. Uh, you know, of course, anecdote is not data, um, but here's a kind of a cool, um, a cool stream system just outside of Seattle uh, in western Washington. And, and here you can see the beaver dam. Here's the downstream side. Here's the upstream side. And uh, here are two freshly dug coho salmon reds or nests. Uh, so at least at least two fish had no problem surmounting this this beaver dam. Uh, and in fact, you know, the evolutionary connection between beavers and salmonids is so deep uh, that it inspired my favorite bumper sticker, which is that beavers taught salmon to jump, right? <clears throat> so of course we know historically beavers were much, much more prevalent upon the landscape than they are today. Today we've got maybe 15 million beavers or so in North America, nobody really knows. Uh, but historically, we had as many as 400 million beavers in, in North America. And of course, those hundreds of millions of beavers would have created hundreds of millions of acres of pond and wetland habitat that we don't have today. And a lot of what I tried to do in, in my book is you know, go through old explorers journals, trappers accounts, Native American histories, uh, to kind of piece together what a, a fully beavered landscape looked like. Uh, and there's no question that it was much wetter and lusher and greener and bluer uh, than, it, than it is today. Uh, you know, you read about explorers crossing the state of Indiana and finding and not finding a dry place to camp for a hundred miles because beavers had so thoroughly impounded the Midwest. Uh, here's a, a nice quote, I think, from Meriwether Lewis, of, of course, of Lewis and Clark fame. Uh, this is from uh, the Missouri Basin in, in present-day Montana, and uh, Lewis basically describes seeing a, a number of beaver dams succeeding each other up every tributary of the Missouri River, you know, as far as the eye could see toward Montana. I mean, Lewis is describing beaver, beavers and, and beaver dams and ponds in his journal basically every day uh, of, the core of, the, of, of the core of Discovery's trip. Uh, so there's no question that, you know, this, this continent was just once chock-a-block with beavers. So that was in 1805. Uh, that Lewis talked about seeing beaver dams in every tributary. In 1843, I believe, uh, John James Audubon, the famous naturalist and painter, traveled the exact same route up the Missouri, uh, painting mammals. Uh, he was in a kind of a mammal phase at that point. And he was looking for a beaver to paint, and he couldn't find a single beaver in the entire Missouri River. So what happened between 1805 and 1843? How did we go from beavers being ubiquitous to beavers being totally absent. What did they turn into? Well, of course, they turned into hats, right? Uh, I think, you know, people tend to hear the phrase beaver hat. You think of like a big furry kind of Davy Crockett thing, um, but beaver hats were these, you know, these elegant Victorian top hats. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the trajectory of the fur trade is basically, so there, there are two species of beavers. There's the North American beaver, Castor canadensis, which we have, and the Eurasian beaver, Castor fiber, which is in Europe and Asia. Uh, so, over the course of many, many hundreds of years, uh, Europeans basically virtually wiped out um, castor fiber, the Eurasian beaver, uh, and then arrived in North America, you know, in the early 1600s, which is when the fur trade gets going, uh, and, you know, and find this incredible kind of untapped store of beavers, and uh, basically set out eliminating beavers from every single river, stream, pond and lake they encounter. Uh, you know, the fur trade begins in the Northeast in New England, uh, you know, almost immediately eliminates beavers there, starts spreading west and, uh, and, and south. Uh, and, you know, by the mid 1800s, uh, beavers are virtually extinct, or are sort of functionally extinct in, in the lower 48. Uh, and the reason that beavers were such a, a desirable Commodities is, is sort of an interesting quirk of beaver biology. Uh, they've got, beavers have two layers of fur. They've got these kind of long, coarse outer guard hairs, and then they've got these softer hairs underneath uh, the beaver under fur, which, which trappers call beaver wool. And if you looked at those little under hairs under a microscope, you'd see that each one has kind of a, a hook or a barb at the end, which causes them to lock together like Velcro and makes this amazing durable, malleable, waterproof hat making material uh, that, you know, was really along with timber and, and cod, uh, the most important economic resource that Europeans found in, in, in North America. Uh, and it's really hard to overstate the extent to which 
the, the beaver trade, the fur industry, drove early American history. Uh, but, you know, the Revolutionary War, you know, one of the British offenses that kind of angered the colonists was denying the colonists access to beaver trapping grounds west of the Appalachians. You know, the Louisiana Purchase was uh, partly fueled by Jefferson's desire to secure new trapping grounds. Uh, it was, you know, it was beaver traders and trappers that spread smallpox and many of the diseases that, uh, that decimated so many native tribes. So, you know, the story of the fur trade is really uh, the story of, of early American history and all of its kind of grandiosity and, and tragedy. Here's you know, one amazing indicator, I think, of, of how deeply embedded beavers were in early economies. This is, a, uh, this is a beaver coin minted by the Oregon Territory in 1849. And the value of one beaver coin was fixed to the value of one beaver pelt. So the whole economy actually operated under the pelt standard. I think that's, uh, that's, that's pretty remarkable. So as, as significant economically as the beaver trade was, it was perhaps even more significant uh, ecologically, right? We don't really think about beaver trapping in the same terms as we think about the deforestation of New England or the busting of the Midwestern prairie or gold mining in California as one of the seminal ecological catastrophes uh, that really shaped North America. But what happens when you trap out several hundred million beavers? Well, you 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 know, you lose several hundred million acres of, of ponds and wetlands. I mean, what did it mean for, you know, coho salmon or moose or wood ducks or boreal toads that there was this profound destruction of beaver created habitat? We'll never fully understand the changes that beaver trapping wrought on the landscape, but there's, there's no question it was a, a hugely consequential and, and even cat cataclysmic event uh, for, for many, many species. So by 1900 or so, you know, we've, we've sort of reached the, the nadir of the beaver population in North America. We're down to 100,000 beavers or so, uh, nearly all of them in Canada. Again, the lower 48 is, is, is essentially without beavers. Uh, but fortunately, uh, around this time, you know, state fish and game agencies begin to recognize that, hey, this is a really important animal that we need to get back on our, our landscapes. And uh, Oregon has a big beaver reintroduction program. Washington, California, New York, uh, you know, there are kind of beaver reintroductions happening all over the country, a lot of them using beaver stock from, from Canada, which is again, you know, the only place you can really find a beaver uh, by, you know, by the, by the turn of the century. Uh, of course, the most famous beaver reintroduction project uh, occurred in, in Idaho. Uh, I'm gonna try to play some, some YouTube footage here for a second. Um, let's see if this works. Just give it one second. Oh no, we've got this, we've got the spinning, the spinning pinwheel of death. It's never a good sign. Okay, let's try this again. The pinwheel of death is still spinning. That's 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 never a good sign. Let's, let's see if I just fast forward this a little bit. Well, okay, this might not work. But um, basically, so so in Idaho in uh, in 19 and you and you can you can find this YouTube footage for yourself later. Um, but essentially, in, in 1948, uh, Idaho had kind of a, a the, the bright idea of um, of essentially airdropping beavers into what is today the Frank Church wilderness. At first they tried moving beavers on horseback. Uh, the horses didn't like that very much, but uh, you know, this is 1948. It's just sort of, you know, post-World War II. Uh, they've got all of these, these surplus uh, airplanes and, and parachutes on hand. And uh, this one biologist has the bright idea of, of basically parachuting 76 beavers. Uh, into uh, into the Frank Church wilderness. Uh, 75 of the beavers actually survived. One unfortunately escaped escaped from the crate uh, in midair and fell to his death uh, very tragically. But the next year, when uh, when these guys flew back over that landscape, they saw that beavers had established in every single place where they'd been released. So this was actually uh, an incredibly uh, successful, effective program at the time. No longer state of the art, obviously. So when you when when this is over, go on YouTube, search for 
Fur for the Future Idaho, and uh, you'll find you'll you'll be able to watch the full 12-minute long unabridged version of uh, of, of beavers being airdropped into the Idaho backcountry. Uh, sorry that sorry that video didn't work. Usually it usually it does. So thanks to all of these beaver relocation and reintroduction projects. In, in the mid 20th century, there's kind of this beaver population explosion. Beavers are recovering all over the country. Uh, but the problem is that, of course, we have thoroughly colonized the landscape in their absence, right? It turns out that good human habitat and good beaver habitat uh, are basically one and the same. We both like, you know, broad, fertile floodplains like the well, like the Willamette Valley. Uh, you know, we like we like low gradient streams. That's where we, you know, we build our, our uh, railroad tracks and our, our, our towns and our farms and our roads. Uh, and when beavers and humans overlap, uh, conflicts tend to arise. I would argue that, you know, that we're the nuisance species, not, not them so much. Uh, but there's no question that beavers can be challenging to live with. Uh, here's a set of railroad tracks in Massachusetts that I visited a few years ago. Uh, these tracks had just been sort of rebuilt uh, at a cost of about a million dollars. And uh, within a few months of their completion, beavers had them underwater, as you can see here. Uh, here's a, a kind of a, a cool cabin in, in uh, New Mexico near Taos that I stumbled upon. Uh, you can see that the cabin's basically underwater. And what's cool here that you can sort of see in this picture is that so beavers you know, start their dam over here. They build up to the base of the cabin. Then they incorporate the cabin in their dam. And they continue on this side. So, you know, I wouldn't want to be that landowner, but you have you have to admire the ingenuity of the, the beavers in this case. Uh, another very common beaver conflict is, is damming and road culverts. Uh, you know, of course, the culvert kind of uh, basically acts like a leak in the dam, and 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 by you know plugging up that leak, beavers hope to turn the entire roadbed into one giant impermeable dam. Uh, what happens there, of course, is the water rises and washes the road out. Uh, very expensive to, to fix. That's probably the most common source of beaver conflicts uh, in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, and then every once in a while, beavers get even weirder. Uh, here's a, a beaver that, uh, that broke into a department store in Maryland and was actually browsing the plastic Christmas tree rack when it was, when it was captured. So there's no, there's no end to the kind of the weird mischief that beavers uh, get into. So of course, the way these, these sorts of conflicts are, are almost invariably handled is by trapping out the offending beaver, right? Which makes a lot of sense. You know, the beaver's causing a problem, get the beaver out of there. Uh, every year, uh, the USDA traps about 20,000 beavers uh, around the country. Private trappers kill, you know, hundreds of thousands of quote unquote nuisance beavers more. And, uh, you know, the problem with our kind of our reflexive knee jerk approach to beaver management is, is twofold. I mean, first, when you beavers you're eliminating that great pond and wetland habitat they create but the other issue is that by trapping of the beavers all you're doing is putting up a, a vacancy sign for the next family of beavers right as long as the habitat is there the beavers are going to come back so you know i think it behooves us to think about some more ecologically sensible ways of, of handling beaver conflicts uh here's kind of a cool cool case study from colorado uh, this is a, a reservoir where uh, a land trust basically wrapped some, some native cottonwood trees in, uh, in wire uh, and then left unfenced the non-native Siberian elm trees. This is actually invasive species control using beavers as an instrument. I think that's, that's pretty cool. So I don't think that any beaver should ever be killed for the crime of cutting down a tree, right? That's just too easy a problem to fix. When the issue is flooding, a little bit more challenging, but, but there too, we've got options. Uh, this is a contract called a flow device, basically a pipe and fence system. You pass the, the pipe uh, through the dam or through the culvert, the fence is there to uh, basically prevent the beavers from plugging that up. Uh, and you're basically creating a leak, right? You're moving water from the upstream side to the downstream side and just lowering the pond uh, to a level that both humans and beavers can tolerate. And these, these kinds of things work 85 to 95% of the time. Here's kind of one, one cool case study. This is from Logan, Utah. Uh, this building back here is a Walmart. Here's the Walmart parking lot. And beavers have basically created this wonderful little wetland, uh, essentially in a Walmart parking lot. Walmart didn't like that very much, uh, but to their credit, they worked with, uh, with, with local scientists at Utah State 
uh, to put in some flow devices and basically create a kind of a, 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 a beaver adaptive management program uh, to non-lethally manage these animals and, and let this wetland remain in place. So that's kind of a cool, uh, yeah, a cool example of how you can you can live with beavers uh, in a very very urban context, right? If Walmart can do it, anybody can do it. Another option uh, for, for dealing with troublemaking beavers that's, that's you know, much more common in, in Washington state than in, in Oregon uh, is, is beaver relocation. Uh, this is a beaver live trap called a Hancock trap, uh, which you bait with some scent lure or, or willow uh, and catch yourself a beaver. Pretty straightforward. Uh, so beavers, of course, we know are, are, again, they're very family oriented animals, right? They live in these colonies. And you know, your goal when you, when you relocate beavers um, is you know you're trying to capture and move the entire colony at once, right? If you separate the parents from their kits, those kits are almost certainly going to die. The problem is that a lot of the beavers that you that you're going to catch are going to be those two-year-old teenage dispersing beavers that you know don't have a territory or a family of their own yet. They're looking for a place to live, and they end up you know in an irrigation ditch. So when that happens, what a lot of beaver projects do. Um, in, in Washington is they basically try to create sort of a, a beaver tender, a beaver matchmaking service where they're pairing up males and females, young males and females, trying to create compatible couples that they can then move as a unit together uh, onto public land somewhere. And ideally, because the beavers are already paired up, they're not compelled to go wandering around looking for a mate, right? They just settle down and start uh, building where you, where you stick them. Of course, the problem with, with uh, or the, the challenge, I guess, um, of making these wonderful compatible beaver couples is that beavers are actually impossible uh, to visually sex. You can't tell a male beaver from a female beaver by looking at it. Uh, this picture is, this is Sandy and Chomper. Uh, Sandy's the female, Chomper's the male. And you can see they're basically visually indistinguishable. And part of the issue is that, is that male beavers actually have internal genitalia, uh, you know, which makes sense, right? If you're an animal that spends its whole life you know, swimming around log jams, you don't want a little dangling appendage that you're going to get snagged on something. It's much more, you know, hydrodynamic to keep it nice and nice and tucked up. So how do you tell a, a male beaver from a female beaver? Well, beavers have, uh, they have very poor eyesight, but very good senses of smell. They actually have two different sets of scent organs, the castor sacs and the anal glands, uh, which they use to mark their territories. And this is, this is a, a beaver's anal gland. Those are my hands, you know, sort of doing the expressing of the anal gland. And uh, basically the idea is you squirt a, a dollop of beaver scent secretion uh, onto a tissue uh, or your fingers if you're really brave and you smell it. And if it smells like cheese, it's a, a female beaver. And if it smells like motor oil, uh, it's a male beaver. I know that that sounds very unscientific, uh, but uh, you know, a beaver biologist can tell with about 99% accuracy uh, a male from a female. So the other issue with relocation, of course, is that you know, is that you don't you don't just want to dump the beavers out there without any kind of protection, right? They'll, they'll get eaten by a, a you know a cougar or a bear right away. Um, so you know, a lot of projects do build them these kind of starter lodges. Uh, here's a, a a beaver, you know, using his starter lodge, and uh, you know, the beavers aren't they're not going to stay there for very long, right? Probably for a few days, uh, just until they can build build a, a lodge of their own. Um, but this is you know a nice way to just protect them from predation when they hit the ground. Uh, and increasingly, you know, we also see projects building beaver dam analogs, right? Human built beaver dams uh, that the beavers can, you know, can kind of work on themselves and maintain, just create a little pool of water so they feel comfortable. And, uh, you know, this is a great way of, of getting beavers to colonize areas uh, that they might not otherwise uh, necessarily want to live in. To, to, to live in. Um, you know, of course, the one sort of occupational hazard here is, is uh, broken fingers. So just, just watch out for that. <laughs> I just want to conclude by talking a little bit about, about you know, a few of the fantastic things that beavers do. You know, I've been talking about, uh, you know, relocating beavers, uh, you know, using these kind of elaborate pipe and fence systems to, you know, mitigate their impacts. I mean, why go to all of this trouble? What do beavers do uh, besides creating good fish habitat that we might care about? Well, I think that, you know, the biggest um, and, and most important thing in a lot of ways is that they're, they're just fantastic agents of stream restoration. Uh, all over the American West, right? This is a, a stream, this is Maggie Creek, which is in Northeast Nevada. Uh, this picture was taken in 1980. And this is basically the, the product of about a hundred years or so of, of unmanaged grazing, right? Cows just hanging out in the valley bottom, devouring all the vegetation, uh, and you end up with this, you know, this very kind of 
erosive, degraded, lifeless channel. So in this case, um, what the Bureau of Land Management did in, in partnership with, with local ranchers is basically put in a, a few kind of common sense, you know, riparian grazing prescriptions, right? They put up some fencing, uh, they kind of changed the, the timing of the, the grazing rotations. And, uh, you know, thanks to those, those pretty basic measures, uh, you know, the, the vegetation started to recover in, in kind of the mid, the mid 90s. You know, you've got cattails and, and willow regrowing. And beavers weren't explicitly a part of this project, right? I mean, you know, nobody had beavers on their mind when they when they started, you know, protecting this this stream. Uh, this kind of magical way of, uh, of finding finding new food sources. Beavers recolonized Maggie Creek uh, and a few other streams in the in that watershed and the, the Humboldt River basin, and uh, you know, did their beaver thing and uh, and really changed things pretty dramatically. So this picture again, this is in 1980. The next picture I'm going to show you is from 2017 uh, when I visited, you know, pretty much this same spot. So here's just keep this picture in mind and then check out this. That's pretty cool, right? That looks that looks a whole a whole, a whole lot better. Uh, so of course, you know, you, you can just look at this and say, okay, you know, this is a healthier uh, a healthier aquatic ecosystem than this. Um, but of course, because there were scientists involved, they also quantified. Uh, some of the changes that were going on at, at various streams in this in this basin, and uh, you know a few of those changes included a, a 20 acre increase in open water, right? Beavers creating ponds and wetlands, uh, fantastic. You know waterfowl and and, uh, and Lahontan cutthroat trout habitat. Uh, beavers actually added three miles of wetted stream length to this tributary. So basically, by slowing water down, they ensured that there would still be water in the stream in you know, August and September. So they're basically taking this seasonal stream and making it perennial. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, you also saw a two foot increase in the water table, right? So you know, in a beaver pond, there's all of the visible surface water, but what you don't see is all of the water that's being forced into the ground, you know, recharging aquifers, rehydrating soil, raising that water table, which led to a, to a hundred acre increase in, uh, in riparian plant growth. And that's a really big deal for this is a uh, James Ancher in northeast Nevada, and uh, you know the point that he made to me when I visited him is that beavers were increasing grass production tenfold for him by by irrigating his valleys. Uh, so that's you know more weight on his cap, more money in his pocket. So there in northeast Nevada, you know a, a very uh, you know very conservative place. Um, you know there's this kind of this wonderful progressive cluster of uh, of pro beaver ranchers. I think that's a, a kind of a, a cool a cool story. The other fabulous thing that beavers do is, of course, they're wonderful agents of pollution filtration, right? You know, beaver, a beaver dam slows the water down, uh, and all of those suspended sediments and solids and pollutants, you know, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the heavy metals, all of that stuff has the opportunity to basically settle out of the water column uh, and get entrained in, in soil. So here you can really see nicely, you know, how much, how much sediment uh, has been built up over, over time. And... Uh, <clears throat> In, in England, where beavers have, have recently been reintroduced, uh, researchers there found that a single pair of beavers, just, just two beavers, uh, in, in the course of a couple of years, captured 100 tons of sediment, 15 tons of carbon. So that's you know a huge amount of carbon being sequestered, uh, and a ton of nitrogen. So that that sediment, carbon, um, you know, agricultural runoff capture benefit, that you know that that filtration capacity, uh, is a really crucial beaver service. Another fabulous thing that beavers do is that they slow down floods, right? Again, I mean, all of these, you know, all of these beaver dams uh, and ponds and wetlands are, are slowing, storing, sinking, spreading out water uh, and basically mitigating floods at a, a pretty significant scale. And, that, and that's why we see beaver reintroduction in the UK. This is a, a beaver dam in Scotland, uh, where again, I mean, a very, a very rainy place, not unlike, you know, Western Washington or, or uh, Western Oregon. Uh, where you know every year flooding is kind of this this classic, uh, very destructive problem, and there beavers are being reintroduced primarily for their flood mitigation capacity. And then the, the final kind of fantastic beaver benefit, of course, is their 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 ability as to be agents of climate change adaptation, right? You know, we know that the West is getting hotter and drier uh, as the climate warms. That's making us much more flammable, obviously. Uh, you know, or wildfire seasons are, are, getting, are getting worse with every passing year, it seems. 
Uh, so here's you know, the kind of the, the role that beavers have to play. This is uh, a picture of the Sharps fire, uh, fire in Idaho a couple of years ago. And you can see that you know, these, these uplands, these hill slopes have just been burnt to a crisp. And the only wet, green, lush, living place on this landscape is this beaver-influenced valley bottom. So the notion that beavers create fire refugia uh, where you know animals and plants can take shelter during wildfires and even fire breaks that you know essentially stop fire in its tracks I mean, that's something that's something that we in the, in the Mexico Valley in Washington is you know you, you, there are several places where you know one side of a, a beaver a beaver wetland is burnt to a crisp and the other side is still green because beavers have basically created a fire break so given all of these wonderful beaver benefits, you know, it's, it's worth asking, how come beavers are not more widely embraced and, and adopted as, as, as ecosystem restoration agents? You know, how come we still kill so many of them? And I think that, you know, a, a big problem is that, you know, we, we've, we've sort of suffered this ecological amnesia uh, in, on this continent, right? We, you know, we, when we trapped out all of the, you know, hundreds of millions of beavers uh, in the, you know, in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, uh, you know, we converted thousands and thousands of miles of streams from, you know, complex pond and wetland complexes into these single thread, gravel bottomed, free flowing, fast moving streams, right? This is the sort of stream that you would see in, you know, in a, a field and stream magazine or an Orvis catalog. But, you know, again, these kinds of classic streams or, or what we consider classic streams, or again, not, not what a lot of North America would have looked like before European colonization, right? We know that our, our streams would have been, you know, multi-threaded instead of single-threaded. They would have been slow moving. There would have been, you know, much more dead, dead and dying tree elements on the, the landscape. You know, a, a beaver, you know, the streams would have been leaping their banks and inundating the floodplains constantly, right? Beavers create what looks to us like chaos. Um, but as we've seen, is uh, you know a far healthier system uh, in all kinds of important ways. So I think that to fully embrace beavers, we have to reconceptualize uh, what uh, what a healthy aquatic ecosystem looks like. So I guess to sum it all up, you know we've got these fantastic animals that uh, that provide us all of these wonderful ser wonderful services. They do this restoration work far more cheaply than we could ever do with our with our you know our back hose and bulldozers and front loaders. Uh, and they do it all without permits, most importantly. Um, so to sum it all up, you know, I think it's time that we, we stepped out of the way. And as the, the mantra of the beaver believer goes, let the rodent do the work, right? That's, that's, uh, that's, I'm, I'm going to get that tattooed on, on me someday. So um, with that, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for, for hanging out this evening. Um, the last thing that I'll mention is that I, I did write this book, uh, Eager. And um, and uh, right right now uh, I've I've been I've been sending signed versions uh, signed copies to people as kind of quarantine reading, um, and uh, for thirty dollars I'll send I'll send you a book and half of that money uh, I've been donating to the coronavirus relief fund which is set up by Crooked Media and that money gets dispersed to Meals on Wheels and the CDC Foundation and and other uh, other sort of nonprofits that desperately need the money right now and uh, you can just email me. Um, there's my uh, my email address, and uh, I, I would love to send you a copy. And uh, again, I don't I don't profit off of this. I just uh, the, the money just covers costs, and half of it gets donated. So, thanks for thanks for considering that. And um, yeah, with that, I guess we'll turn it over uh, to uh, the Oregon Wild folks, and and maybe take some questions at the end. So, that's it. Thank you guys so much. All right, thanks, Ben. That was great. Uh, now we're gonna turn it over to Daniel Moser. She's gonna give us a ooh. Turn off my own sound, um, and she's going to do a brief presentation, and then we'll do some Q and A. Oops. My screen been shared there. Danielle, you should have control now. Oh, there you go. Great. Okay. 
Well, thanks everyone for uh, for joining the webinar tonight. And uh, you know, I'm really appreciative for lots of reasons, but especially because it gave me a reason to brush my hair. Uh, so it's been many days since that. So, so thank you. And I think my husband probably thanks you all as well. So, um, but in all seriousness, really appreciate you uh, being on this webinar tonight and, and uh, learning about beavers and now what what Oregon Wild is doing in way of, of wildlife uh, protection and restoration. Uh, here in the state. So um, I'm going to try to be as quick as possible so that we can get to some Q&A. So if I um, quickly go through something, um, I'll have my email address at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to, um, to email me if you have additional questions. But um, so I'm the Wildlife Program Coordinator for Oregon Wild. Our mission is to protect and restore Oregon's wildlands, wildlife and waters as an enduring legacy for all Oregonians. We work on everything from protecting old growth forests, reforming logging practices, making sure we have clean, abundant, free-flowing rivers and streams, and of course, ensuring there's thriving uh, native wildlife populations here in the state. So, um, so what I do, um, advocating for Oregon's wildlife. Um, for full disclosure, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a biologist, um, I'm an advocate, and, and that's really what our wildlife program is focused on. Is, is being a voice for the state's wildlife in all these different arenas when it comes to decision making. So um, you can see the, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife logo. Uh, obviously that is one of the, the main um, uh, agencies that oversees what's happening on the ground with our state's fish and wildlife. Um, you know, historically they've, it's been a tr it's been challenging with them. Um, you know, they've been sort of known to be a hunting and fishing group um, and sort of see, uh, you know, the state's wildlife oftentimes is sort of a commodification and, and a way to raise revenue. So, you know, one of our goals is to make sure that this agency is actually fulfilling its whole mission uh, to protect all species and and to make sure that we have thriving ecosystems and, and again, abundant wildlife. So um, that's one of the things we're working on. Right below that, uh, kind of hard to see, but it's an image of, the, of our activists testifying in front of the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, you know, the commission is the premier decision making body for the state's fish and wildlife. And so uh, most things are going to them uh, to decide, you know, which species deserve uh, state endangered species act protections, uh, what's going on with our hunting and fishing regulations and a whole host of other things for, you know, to conservation and management plans. So who is on that commission, you know, whether or not they're going to uphold science, they're going to reflect public values. These are really important things. And so one of my things is to advocate to advocate for um, a commission that is really going to do all of those things. Um, and then you have in the top right the, the image of our state capital in Salem. Um, I always jokingly say I have a love-hate relationship with this part of my work, um, spending time with legislators, especially when it's mostly to, to try to stop bad legislation from passing, but of course there are opportunities uh, to promote good legislation. But again, another a really important piece when it comes to what's going to happen with our, with our um, state's fish and wildlife. And then finally, the last logo you can see is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So, um, you know, they obviously oversee the Federal Endangered Species Act. So lots of lots of species in Oregon are listed there. Um, and so, you know, we we're advocating and, and commenting and making sure that they're they're doing again right by science, right by management. So the reason I showcase all of this is because, you know, we can do as much as we want on individual species levels. We can we can, you know, try to to get better management plans and we can try to do X, Y, and Z when it comes to protecting animals and wildlife. But if we don't have folks, at, you know, at the on these boards and commissions in the legislature that really see the value of, of our wildlife, um, it's, it's tough to move any agenda. So that's why that's a really big focus. Um, and then as Ben touched on, you know, just the importance of keystone species. So I tend to call it the conservation of the keystones is sort of my area of focus when we're determining which species we're going to work on. Obviously, there are so many species in Oregon that I could spend all of my day and nights and weekends um, trying to be an advocate for all of them, um, which is tough to do. So we we whittle it down and, and we tend to focus on, on the keystones. Um, and I won't obviously repeat what Ben already told us about being an ecological keystone species, I will just say that Oregon Wild has come to to sort of expand that definition where we have ecological keystone species, we have political keystone species, and we have social keystone species. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, from a political standpoint, there are species that um, 
obviously can be very contentious. It brings in a whole host of other issues and other stakeholders to the table. Um, and so those can be really important to drive change um, at a policy level. So at the bottom, you see an image of a marble merlet, which is this um, rare nesting seabird on the Oregon coast. And, uh, you know, they nest in old growth forests. And so just purely by their habitat, it sort of makes things contentious. So they have a lot of political significance. And then you have obviously social keystone species, which tend to be the very charismatic megafauna that we all sort of swoon over, like wolves and sea otters and, and beavers as well. Um, and, you know, we use those as, as sort of the gateway to also protecting other species. Um, you know, they're the ones that sort of get people fired up and energized to want to take action, to want to be advocates. Um, as much as I love red tree voles, that's not necessarily the species that people are getting up out of, out of bed in the morning to go and, and fight for. So they help us um, be able to talk about larger landscape, ecological system reform and other species needs um, through, through getting people engaged on those species. Um, so now heading into what's going on with beavers in Oregon, um, you know, and I, I called this specific and, I, and statewide, you could call it local and specific or statewide or broader, but these are different efforts that are happening. Um, and I, what I'll say for Oregon Wild's perspective is, you know, our focus is to be a bit more on that, again, 10,000 foot level. How can we get institutional change and reform and make sure our programs and policies in place can drive all these local efforts to be, um, you know, to be worthwhile and to, and to have the value. So, um, so anyway, on the specific end, you know, there's obviously local beaver and beaver dam restoration efforts. Um, you know, there's different entities, be it tribes, federal, um, who are trying to change the trapping uh, restrictions. Um, and, and so, you know, and a lot of these are all connected and interlinked, obviously, to be able to do true restoration, you know, you need to be able to, um, to prohibit trapping in, in specific areas. Um, ben also touched on, you know, there's a lot of translocation efforts. So, you know, maybe there's a specific place in Oregon where they have been locally extirpated. So now trying to bring them back as a way to restore the watershed. Um, and then again, through another effort is just general wetlands restoration or coho restoration or other things. And through that lens, trying to incorporate uh, beaver restoration. So those are, you know, again, a variety of things happening at a very localized level. Um, and then on the statewide, I would say, um, you know, for example, the governor has this new 100 year water vision. Um, and so Oregon Wild, you know, when we were at the table, one of the things we asked is how do beavers fit in this? You know, if we're talking about trying to have uh, quality, high quality and quantity of water for the next 100 years, beavers should be a pretty integral piece to this. So, you know, just trying to ask those important questions as different programs and policies are being developed is sort of our role. Um, the same is true for the trapping regulation. So you sort of have localized efforts um, to try to change that. And then of course, what's happening statewide at the commission in the legislature to try to review and potentially change those regulations. Um, you know, some folks have been advocating for a beaver conservation plan, again, to more comprehensively assess and determine what we should be doing um, uh, to, to restore beavers and to bring them into the fold of other habitat and landscape um, conservation. And then really importantly, as it relates to climate change policy, you know, different natural resources agencies are looking at how can we be adapting and, and mitigating climate change. And of course, beavers should really be at the core of that. And then just to reiterate that, you know, a big program priority for us is always trying to make sure the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife really adheres to their whole mission of, of protecting, enhancing all species. And again, we think beavers are a major driver in doing that. So, um, you know, my final slide is just how to be an advocate for, for Oregon's beavers. So a couple of suggestions that you can, you know, leave the webinar today and be able to do. One is to sign up for, for Oregon Wild's wolf pack list. Um, many of you are probably on the Oregon Wild list and this is how you heard about the event. But if you're not on the wolf pack list, um, that is a specific list um, that's run by me. I send out a monthly newsletter and it's just related to wildlife. So if there's opportunities or, or you know, just ways to engage on beavers, it's going to be coming through on that list. So I'd recommend um, signing up. And then, you know, I would suggest just get to know your local on the ground efforts in your community. So 
I, you know, I know some of the local efforts. I don't, I'm not an expert on that. So I would recommend asking your local watershed council wetlands group. Perhaps there's a beaver working group or an organization. Just get to know them so you could potentially be boots on the ground to help with the actual restoration um, of beavers. And then finally, I would say, if nothing else, please, you know, email the Department of Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, there's the email down there, and just let them know that you support developing a beaver conservation plan, that the agency should be taking this more seriously, that they should be incorporating it into everything that they do and think about. Uh, and then of course, just to have them re, uh, reconsidering what their trapping regulations are for beavers. So with that, I'll try to leave some time for Q&A and uh, thank you. And there's my email if you have any additional questions. So thanks. Thanks, Danielle. Um, and hopefully, um, this great. Um, hopefully, I don't get uh, some sound feedback here. Um, I uh, have a few questions. Actually, I actually have a bunch of questions, so I'm going to have to. I'm going to try to pick the ones that are most either repeated or um, generally interesting uh, that a couple of people asked on the topic. Uh, one of them, um, I think, is that came up a couple times is. Uh, ben, can you talk about the relationship that beavers have with other um, animals that kind of share some of their habitat, like nutria or river otters? Yeah, that's a, a good a good question. So, you know, I mean, I mean beavers are they're, you know they're creating good habitat for just about any semi-aquatic mammal. Um, you know, otters and, and nutria certainly included. Um, otters actually uh, uh, prey on beaver kits occasionally. Um, so you know, the beavers don't love having them around, but the otters, you know, do, do very well in beaver in beaver complexes. And you know, I mean, the, the nutria the nutria issue is is an issue. There's you know, there, there it is true that um, you know that beavers are are creating nutria habitat um, in in uh, in some cases, including in, in Oregon, that they, they, they cohabitate in, uh, in in many spots. And you know, and that's something to uh, you know, certainly um, consider in, in in beaver restoration is you know the, the potential for for uh, you know non desirable non native species to to also colonize those areas. Um, a few people asked about if you had any insight into um, why beavers chose certain um, species rather than others. A couple of people uh, mentioned western red cedar. Uh, and then a few people were asking about um, behavior in terms of uh, beavers um, taking down a bunch of trees, but not necessarily eating them or dragging them and using them for construction. And any if you had any insight into their behavior there? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the cedar thing is really interesting. I mean, that is, uh, you know, that's that's certainly you would you wouldn't see um, that in any you know textbook of of beaver preferred beaver foods. But um, yeah, they do they do take cedar um, somewhat readily, it seems, in you know in areas where they, they don't have a ton of other options, um, as well as you know as, as well as some some other conifers. I mean, that, you know, it's, it's they they do seem to habituate to certain plants you know I, I was talking to a friend who's a you know a beaver trapper and relocator recently and he described a beaver that that he trapped out of this stream that had pretty much nothing but dug fur uh, along it and when he, when he had the beaver in captivity subsequently um, it wouldn't eat anything but dug fur uh, which is pretty 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 wild um, as for you know as for felling trees and uh, and Using them only as construction material rather than as a food source. Yeah, they they absolutely uh, do do that as well. But they but they do seem to be eating cedar, um, at least at least in in some cases. Uh, are there any national protections for beavers? Um, there are there are no national protections. They are they are not an endangered species. Um, and uh, yeah, they are they are uh, totally totally unprotected. Um, I'm gonna try to pick one more before we wrap up. Um, I, I think this one is interesting. What does the inside of a beaver lodge look like? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a it's a cool space. So there's there's basically um, again as I, said, as I said there's there's kind of an elevated nesting chamber, um, you know, just above above the water. A lot of, a lot of lodges sort of have two 
levels essentially. Um, one that's almost like a you know like a, a mud room, uh, and then and then one that's kind of more more for living quarters. Um, and, th and they keep they, they keep very neat uh, very neat chambers. Um, they usually line the, the floor of the lodge with with wood chips, and uh, yeah, they're they're pretty they're pretty uh, fastidious creatures for sure. So yeah, you should you go Google inside of the Beaver Lodge, and there are a lot, a lot of a lot of cool pictures out there. Um, and and last one, which I think Danielle, you touched on a little bit, but I don't know if you have some more to say about how do we get more beavers in Oregon. Well, I, I, that's an interesting question, I guess, because some of the challenges we don't we don't really know how many beavers are in Oregon because you know you know the difference between a, a species that's listed as endangered is there's often you know population estimates and surveys being done. Um, and some of the challenges, I think there's local efforts to know what the be the local beaver population is, but we don't really have like a population assessment. So I think it's more about, you know, what are we doing at these local levels to make sure that they're they're able to thrive and actually do the work that beavers do. So um, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I would recommend that, you know, you just still just email the ODFW commission and say, we wanna make sure that we have enough beavers here on the landscape to, you know to do the important work and help us be more resilient you know to climate change and, and all these different things um because i i don't think we really know how many beavers are here is kind of the challenge so okay um for everyone uh who either missed the beginning of this presentation or would like to have uh, a few people ask for some uh paused at some specific slides um, I will be putting this online hopefully tomorrow on YouTube, and you'll be able to find it at OregonWild.org. Uh, and so I'll, I'll put it on the homepage as soon as it's uploaded. Um, but yeah, I think that's where we'll wrap it up. Thank you both. Um, ben, thanks so much. Uh, I put in the questions uh, Ben's email to um, take him up on his book offer. And thank you for your generosity um, in terms of helping those uh, that are, are dealing with um, uh, the everything that's happening <laughs> um, and thank you all for um uh being with us tonight um everybody stay self safe and healthy take care thank you guys